and a 110.2. Right, so Trump was the, this few, well, two days ago, became the first American president to travel over the, through the DMZ, the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea, and enter North Korea to shake hands with Kim Jong-un, which prompted me to do a little research into how bad Kim Jong-un might be. Now, Kim Jong-un has done stuff like had assassinated his brother, uh, blown up his uncle with missiles, allegedly. Well, you know, he, he's killed some family members. Uh, the, the By the way, I, I would do those things too, if I could get away with it. Okay. Well, the Kims, three generations of the Kim family have run North Korea as long as it's been a country, starting in, I think, 1947. So for the past 72 years. And rough, somewhere between 600,000 and three and a half million people died under the grandpa between 47 and when he died in the 80s. And then under the father, a bunch of people died in the famine that lasted from 1993 to about 2000. And now you got the kid in there. And you know, the, the, the estimates of total deaths are hard to narrow down because this is not a country that shares a lot of information about itself with the world. But a total of 2 million people dying unnecessarily under the Kims over the past 72 years is not an unreasonable kind of mid-range estimate. Wait, so number again? Two million. The, the current population of North Korea is 27 million. So it's roughly 8%, which in a country the size of the US would be like 26 million people dying unnecessarily, to, you know, if you want to be proportional. So, not a good guy. Not, not a good family. Um, you know, I mean, there have been other dictators who've, you know, Stalin killed roughly 50 million of his own people. I don't know if that includes the 25 or 27 million who died in World War II. I don't think so. I'm sorry, 40 million Stalin killed. I guess not including World War II. Uh, Mao killed 50 million of his own people. Hitler uh, racked up about 30 million deaths if you include the people he slaughtered in the camps and his share of the casualties in World War II. So, 2 million is less than 30, 40, and 50 million, but proportionately, it's, it's still a pretty healthy chunk of, of its citizens. I would just like to say that those numbers that you just rattled off about Mao, Stalin, and Hitler are not exactly right. Uh, I could, you could be off by a few million here and there. Well, it's, it's tough. When you're doing genocide, it, it's, it's tough to really pin down the number. Yeah, I know. It's just that our millions of listeners are probably racing to these stat books and want, I just want to make sure that they know that we know that these are rough rough estimates. Oh, speaking of uh, disclaimers, you being my friend, as soon as we stopped taping said, you know, you, we've got to cut out the part where you talked about wanting the darkest skinned uh, candidate to become president. And uh, so I don't want to cut it out because I thought it was goofy. And, um, I, but let me issue the disclaimer. I don't care about the skin color of any candidate. Though, you know, I have tweeted probably 50 times about Trump's skin color. Uh, but that's just for Twitter. Um, but anyway. All right. So your point about the Kim family is what? Well, you know, we could and we probably will shortly have an argument about whether Trump accomplished anything by shaking hands with him, but we, we, we always call him a dictator and, and a bad guy, but nobody, 
you know, I have no idea about the, any kind of range of possible death tolls under the Kims until I did some research. And it's not unreasonable to you know, say that he, he killed a, a, a fair percentage of his, of his citizens, or he and his, and his father and grandfather. Okay. Well, I don't, I'm not going to give you any argument. I've been pretty much aware of what you said all along. I just wanted to put some numbers to it. Um, okay. All right. Well, uh, North Korea is the worst place on earth. Uh, there are places where you die from starvation faster. Uh, they also have diseases that are unpalatable, but as far as countries that have, uh, uh, it is the most authoritarian country in the world. They try to control people's emotions, what they think. Um, they basically have turned their population into robots. That's their goal. They try to control they are, the population of North Korea are controlled to the extent that their, even their thoughts, they are trying to control them by warning the North Koreans that we know what you're thinking. We can tell by your face, uh, your facial expression. They also starve them of information to the extent that we did some operation where we, I think, floated a bunch of thumb drives over the border so that regular people would find them and then plug them into their computers and see awesome, what the awesome things that are available entertainment-wise in the rest of the world? Well, I mean, you couldn't possibly imagine a worse life uh, than the life of, of someone in North Korea. It's, it is a giant prison camp. I've been aware of, of this all my life. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you probably, this is probably leading to an evaluation of Trump's efforts. Should we discuss that? I suppose we should. Because right. we need to so, have a freaking argument. My argument is that uh, he's trying to do something. And um, his goal is to get this horrifying person to not have a nuclear bomb. Nothing else has worked. Uh, he's, trying, uh, he's trying to be very gracious in the way he does it, but the sanctions are very severe. And as we speak, there are nuclear armed submarines off the coast of North Korea with enough weaponry to wipe the entire country off. Uh, out that weren't there under Obama. So Trump is playing the velvet glove over the male fist, and I just hope to God that it succeeds. I don't know, since nothing else that we've tried has ever worked, I don't see any reason to not try what Trump is doing. I, you know, I mean, aside from the kind of goofiness of the whole thing. I, I don't really need to have an argument with you about it. Yeah, we, we really won't know. Put it this way. A year from now, either the North Koreans will have given up their nuclear weapons and Trump will be worthy of the Nobel Peace Prize, or they will be exactly where they were, where they are now, and another American effort will have failed. Okay, all right, fine, let's move on. So. Um, the two topics with regard to Obama that you've brought up the most have been Obama pulling the troops out of Iraq and um, Obama taking out Gaddafi, making Libya, within a short amount of time, a failed state that has slavery. So I read up on this stuff. And reading on the troop pullout, and I'm sure you're going to be able to rebut all this because you're better informed on these issues than I am, but they're not as straightforward as you've argued. 
there was a thing called the U.S. Iraq Iraq Status of Forces Agreement passed in 2008 or created, agreed upon between Iraq and the U.S. in 2008 when George W. Bush was president. The Status of Forces Agreement uh, said that troops would be withdrawn by the end of 2011. Now, according to what I read on Wikipedia, uh, beginning in 2010, Obama was negotiating with the government of Iraq to not have this happen. Obama wanted to, and you, you can, you'll be able to argue, um, wanted to leave 10,000 American troops there. And he wanted them to have immunity from prosecution by the Iraqis. I assume that this is kind of a, like when you're occupying a country, I assume that uh, that's the case. The, at least that's what the occupying power would strongly insist would be the case. Like when we occupied Japan and Germany after World War II, I would assume that American soldiers weren't subject to prosecution by Japanese and German law enforcement. But I don't know. I don't know the history of that. But anyway, Obama was arguing that American troops should have immunity. And Iraq was like, no. And then Obama comes back and says, three to 5,000 troops and still immunity. And then according to the article I was reading, uh, Iraq considered the immunity thing an overreach and said no to any more troops. And Obama, I guess, reluctantly pulled out all troops uh, in mid-December 2011. Um, which makes me think that he wasn't the most eager guy in the world to pull the troops out of Iraq. Iraq. Okay, my response is this. Um, first of all, um, all agreements of that kind can be rescinded if disaster is looming. Uh, as I recall, when we finally sent troops back in, because Iraq had fallen into civil war uh, under Trump, it was because the Iraqi government begged us to do so. So once Iraq fell into civil war, it would have been incumbent on Obama to send troops back. That's the first thing, which he did not do. And instead, he watched ISIS rise to power and create a whole country where parts of Iraq and Syria had been. And in that country, they murdered 200,000 people while Obama watched. I assume he was golfing or eating popcorn yeah. while that was happening. <laughs> Would you please not interrupt me? And I despise him for that. I despise him for letting those 200,000 people die uh, while he watched and did nothing. But I'm not finished. The second thing that I despise Obama for is that when you're occupying a country, if they make a deal you don't like, you just say, sorry guys, we're occupying your country. You're now prostrate, and we kicked your butts, and you're gonna have to do what we think is best. Don't interrupt me. Now, only a spineless, treasonous rat would hang on a legal technicality and get pushed out of a country that we had just crushed. So, had he been anything other than a treasonous rat, he would have said, no, 
we're going to stay here because we don't think that you're capable of uh, governing yourselves uh, for the time being. And when we think you are, we'll pull the troops out. And it seems to me that for the second highest IQ in America man, uh, you should be able to see through a legalistic technicality argument and say, huh, so let me get this straight. Obama was willing to let 200,000 people die because of a legal technicality? Maybe that was a stupid agreement to make, and maybe under the circumstances, you could rescind the agreement. So, okay, so I can't address history after 2011 because I haven't read up on it. But by 2011, since we've been negotiating with the new Iraq government since at least as early as 2008, I assume that by 2011 um, that we weren't occupying. Uh, actually, no. We had uh, 80,000 troops there, roughly. Okay. Who could have, by the way, done whatever the hell they want. All right. So, the, certainly the new Iraq government didn't think that they, I could be wrong on that number. All right. They, 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 we, had an over, we had an overwhelming force there. But in 2011, the Iraqi government, I don't think we thought either that things would fall into the mess they fell into. No, 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 no. May I interrupt for a minute? If you've got contravening... Yeah, no, no, I, I do actually. Because in, 20, in 2011, we did know that. And I'll tell you how we knew that. Because... As dumb a person as an artist who paints naked ladies in a warehouse in the ghetto knew that if you pulled those troops out, that country was going to collapse. But it wasn't just me. It was also the entire Republican Party, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and even Hillary Clinton. All right, that's a good point. And if I can rebut it or not rebut it, I'll read up and come back to you about it next week. Yeah, one of the people that didn't know that was you. Okay, that's true. Okay, I just said that. So you um, don't have much credibility on this issue. No, right? my brand is not knowing every fucking thing. But being very passionate about voting Democrat. No, I'll, I'll still do that. Now, just I, I do have to hit you with a little bit of what about it. Because you're very... You're justifiably angry about the 200,000 people who died across Syria and Iraq and various other parts of the Mideast um, after the last American troops, though I think there were still civilian contractors there, uh, mercenaries, I guess, um, after they were pulled out at the end of 2011. But you do, I mean, 200,000 people is a lot. Um, but you seem less concerned about the somewhere between 200,000 and 600,000 Iraqis who died in the Civil War that began after, the, after we invaded Iraq and, between 2003 and 2007. Um, Rick. 2003, we decided, you can put your arms down, we decided that we had to overthrow Saddam Hussein. Mm -hmm. Once you let loose the dogs of war, almost anything can happen. It, it could have happened that, that they were passive and that they went along with us and we could have sent so many occupying forces in there that we were able to crush any insurgency. We didn't, and they weren't. But I'm willing to accept that in great historical moments, countries will sometimes do things you don't predict, and you will have 
terrible disasters, but you, you're trying to do something that will ultimately work, be, be the right thing. I'll give you an example. Well, hold on, but you're, you're, don't you think it would have been better to red team the invasion? Red team is where you take some of your better people in the military and in the State Department and ask the what if of what if we knock down the government and there are a lot of pissed off people? Well, there's two issues. The first is um, we don't know the exact number that were killed between 2003 and 2008. No, estimates are waiting. They vary widely from roughly 200,000 to 1.1 million. Right, and I think the 1.1 million is a Lancet Medical Journal. Uh, no, I think the Lancet says 640,000. Well, the point is, is that anything, I think the Lancet was over a million, and it was, it was largely discounted as anti-American propaganda. Um, of the 200, let's take the low figure, of the 200,000, or let's take the middle figure, let's say 300,000 died. We don't know how many of those people deserved what they got. A lot of them could have been our enemies trying to fight their way back. Um, but besides that, when you attack an enemy country, if they crumble and start killing each other, that's the deal. In other words, uh, in other words, if, if we attack, let's take a, a real clear bad guy that we attack. If we attack Germany, and in the middle of attacking Germany, they happen to have had a, uh, a coup against Hitler. I'm sure you're aware of that. Well, a bunch of attempted assassinations. Right. Well, if those assassinations had led to civil war in Germany, it would not have been our fault. That's the way history works. You, you, you attack a country, or a country attacks you, and then internal forces in that country can cause chaos. That's not the moral responsibility of the Bush administration. So how long did we occupy Germany after the end of World War II? Well, Rick, I'm glad you asked me that question. Okay. Because one of the reasons I know that Obama is no better than a traitorous rat for pulling the troops out of Iraq is because I know that we had to keep occupying forces in Germany from 2000 or from 1945 to today. And I knew that if we had to keep occupying forces in Germany for over 50 years, that we couldn't simply pull our troops out of Iraq after three years. All right, so hold on. So at some point, the troops we have stationed in Germany are not occupying troops in the way that you occupy an enemy. Yeah, I knew you'd bring that up, so I have another point. Okay, but hold on. In also, not, also no, wait, you no, said no, three years. No, wait, wait, you said three years, but the Iraq War ended no later than 2005. Right, but the Civil War continued until uh, Obama took office, and then we kept them there for three more years. All right, so, anyway, your next point. so good math, Rick. Um, my counter-argument is that it's true that the army in Germany right now is to defend Europe against Russia, but we actually, in 1949, had to put down a rebellion of resurgent Nazis four years after, after World War II was over. So I knew that if in 1949 we were still chasing Nazis around Germany, we were not going to be able to bring troops out of Iraq three years after the country was somewhat pacified. Okay, fine. So let's move on to the next point. Um, you talk, you bring up the we killed, under Obama, we 
took down Qaddafi, or we aided the people who took down Qaddafi and killed him, took him out of power. Yeah. And people can research, I don't want to go into too much about how Qaddafi was a really bad guy, but he, you could argue that he was an even worse guy than Saddam Hussein, and more belligerent to the U.S. even than Saddam. Um, but a couple things. One is that it wasn't just um, Obama and the U.S. taking down uh, Qaddafi. Um, also, as a personal note, Qaddafi's sister uh, invited me to, 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 to be her LinkedIn friend. I don't know why, but I, I did not do it. It just didn't seem like a, a good move. Apparently, she was looking around the world for LinkedIn friends. Um, anyway. Um, it was the U.S. plus a NATO plus, which you know, like a half dozen countries plus the U.N. Um, that's thing one. But before you rebut that, um, you're you know justifiably very concerned about the amount of slavery that's going on in Libya, which is a fallen state. That is, a fallen state is. A nation where the government has just fallen to shit due to civil war or whatever that has that is not able to uh, effectively govern the country. I think roughly 150,000 refugees arrive in Libya because Libya is along the southern coast um, of the Mediterranean, and it's it's the place that refugees, having traveled north through Africa, end up at to try to cross the Mediterranean. And these refugees are subject to horrific abuse, including being you know, sold as slaves, including sex slaves, being raped, being worked to death, being held for ransom, being killed if the ransom doesn't come soon enough, uh, being killed if once the, you know, being held for month after month for payments every month, and if the payments run out, then yeah, killed then too. It's bad. May Obama burn in hell for that. All right, but I would also argue if you look at the history and geography of Libya, just because Gaddafi, if Gaddafi were still in power, Libya, I believe, is the 16th largest nation in the world in land mass, and like. Most North African nations is mostly desert that is kind of a free for all. And I would argue that, yeah, it's worse under a failed state, but a lot of this stuff would still be happening even if Gaddafi were still in charge in Libya, because most of Libya, under Gaddafi or not, is a lawless desert filled with. You know, refugees trying to get to the coast. Then why didn't it happen before? I assume, and some of what I read indicated, that it was going on before 2011 as well. Yeah, well, it's... it's and and if, it, if it was going on less, at least part of the reason was there were fewer refugees arriving in Libya before 2011. Okay, Rick. You're making an argument for failed states being only a little bit worse than countries that are governed and have to adhere to international law and are able to enforce their borders and uh, solve, uh, prevent crime and crime against humanity. So, uh, Rick, the fact that it might have been uh, also, it might have taken place if it uh, is a not, not a convincing argument. Yeah, it's a what-if argument, which are essentially not super convincing. No. And I, I mean, it, it, it kind of saddens me that you're willing to use an argument like that uh, and just not accept that your man caused this because he was almost childlike in his stupidity and incompetence, and that you voted for him twice, and well, I assume... All right, so let me ask you this. 
what should have been done with Libya? Just leave Gaddafi and like try to negotiate with him and make sure, because by 2011, I would argue he was probably a little bit less of a dick than he was under Reagan when he was shooting down American passenger jets. Or shot down at least one American passenger and, and blew up what? He had, was he part of Lockerbie? Lockerbie was a, a plane that, that he was responsible for knocking down and killing hundreds of Western people. Yeah, so he took down at least two plane passenger jets full of, of innocents. Okay. Um, but he hadn't done that in, by 2011, he hadn't done that in, oh, should we have just left him alone? What should we have done with him? Well, you see, one of the arguments, a lot of people hate Bush. And... They hate him because of the Iraq War, uh, among other things. But one of the beauties of kicking Saddam's butt that nobody thinks of is that it brought, uh, it, it knocked some sense into Gaddafi. Uh, Gaddafi realized that we were willing to uh, crush other countries and use our formidable strength uh, with recklessness. Uh, that we were willing to actually go to war in the Middle East and shake off all the sort of self-doubt that we had developed under Vietnam. So uh, he was afraid. Now wasn't there a civil war already going on in 2011 and we aided the combatants who were against Gaddafi? No. What what happened was this. You jumped, you didn't let me finish my point. All right. The goal of, of our Middle East policy was not to right all wrongs. It was to uh, crush Saddam, crush the Taliban, and frighten all the other people out there that might want to mess with us. So we actually accomplished that goal. In fact, Gaddafi was frightened enough that he allowed inspectors in. He announced that he had plans for a nuclear bomb. He allowed inspectors in and abandoned the program. So if he, in other words, he, was, he did exactly what we wanted him to do. So at that point, you leave him alone. All right. And, and because because he's doing what you want, which is not not messing with you anymore. He has been cowed. He's been impressed. And uh, if you decide that for whatever reason you've got to take him out, then you leave an occupying force there, since you say that uh, the British and French went along with us. Then you have a combined force of I, I don't think of a hundred thousand British, French, and American troops. I don't think there were boots on the ground. I think that the U.S. plus NATO plus yes, uh, Rick, Rick, I can tell you what happened. Okay, it was airstrikes. It was it was air support of of Libyans that rose up during the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. So what happened was when 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 the region was was became unstable, uh, partly because of uh, Obama. Uh, all the countries, in the, uh, many of the countries in the region, like Syria, uh, through violence, and, and Egypt through the ballot box, had become unstable and started to elect, uh, overthrow their, their uh, dictators. And so there was a similar rise against the Libyan dictator that Obama supported with airstrikes, which succeeded. And so uh, the, the uh, yeah, and, 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 and then what he should have done was, if he wanted to do that, because I'm no fan of, of Gaddafi, he should have put down uh, 100,000 uh, allied troops and stabilize that country and turn it into a democratic republic. But instead, he just sat back and watched as it turned into a nightmare. Okay, fine. Let's, let's move on. Okay. What's the next topic? All right, moving on. Uh, we have here uh, AOC. 
Okay, so. And the border, right? right. And so a couple things happened today that were big if you live on Twitter as I do. AOC and members of the Hispanic Congressional Caucus uh, went down to see the uh, camps where kids and adults are being held on the U.S.-Mexico border. And ProPublica revealed that there are 20,000 um, employees of CBG, okay, um, uh, what are we? What's CBP? Uh, border um, protect, border protection, Customs and Border Protection. Twenty thousand employees. They, they, they guard the border. They're one of the agencies that guard the border. Uh, and um, ProPublica revealed that ninety-five hundred of them, including current and past employees, belong to a secret Facebook page that shares messages and memes, many of them hostile to immigrants and um, scurrilous in other ways. It's a, it's a secret Facebook page for CBP employees um, with all sorts of messages that are mocking and saying things that are unbecoming of the of, of border protection. So AOC goes down to the border, along with some other uh, Congress people, sees conditions that um, are deplorable. For instance, uh, a bunch of women located in a cell where the sink is broken, so they've been instructed to drink out of the toilet. Um, that was the biggest example of, of yuckiness. Um, Anyway, that's what happened. Uh, my response, Rick, is that if you cared about border security, you would not be encouraging people to come to this country where they'll be given, quote unquote, asylum because they're political refugees, where they'll be given lawyers and court dates and allowed to stay in the country where they'll be given free medical care, free education, um, you would not be encouraging them by speaking in Spanish uh, as, a, as a Democrat presidential candidate. You would not let them think that if they just held out until the Democrats win the election, that there will be a home for them here in the U.S. And if I was AOC, um, I wouldn't need to go to the border and, and she's actually made a claim that she was sexually harassed by Border Patrol while she was down there. Uh, yes, she in was. other words, her goal and your goal, by the way, Rick, are not to support the U.S. in their attempt to close the border. Her goal is to humiliate the border security forces and to exacerbate the situation so that she can bring more illegals to this country. Uh, Rick, uh, you have to, at a certain point, you're going to have to decide whose side you're on. Either you want to close the border down, or you want to, you want to sort of uh, somehow without realizing it, uh, increase the millions of illegal aliens pouring over it. I, and I, I don't understand why you don't understand your role in this. We've had Immigration has been, America is the, I would argue, has been the most immigration based nation, is the most immigration based nation in the world. Um, our, our, our citizens, I mean, we, we started out with a 
country that was, you know, empty except for Native Americans. And then we filled it with people from all over the world. Um, and so it's not a new thing. Um, and the numbers vary. And the solutions for, and the receptiveness varies. Um, and, you know, I'll just let your point stand. I will say one thing that's not exactly on point, but American people, people already in America, do not do enough fucking to maintain the current population. We don't have enough babies. Now, you could argue, and I would agree that, you know, that it, it, it's not completely essential that the U.S. population keeps growing. I mean, it's helpful to certain parts of the economy and to, you know, to have a growing educated population for coming up with new stuff and having a healthy consumer economy. But there are, it's possible to imagine healthy economies in countries that aren't, who don't have growing populations. And a lot of the populations, a lot of the countries with shrinking populations, um, like Russia, have populations that are shrinking because they're fucked up. Russia has shrunk. Japan has been shrinking um, because they went through a 10 or 12 year depression or recession or whatever. Um, but I'm sure you can find countries with stable or shrinking populations that are just fine. On the other hand, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world to have a slowly growing population um, where some of the growth is fed by immigration. Illegal immigration? We'd have to fight about what illegal means because I could say it's not illegal to ask for asylum and then you would say, yeah, but if you reach another country such as Mexico, where you can ask for asylum before you get to the country you really want to go to, the U.S., then it's not legal to, to hopscotch across the country to get to the most desired country. If you're coming from El Salvador and you hit Mexico, you would argue that's where you ask for asylum. And I would say, yeah, but freaking, it's not illegal to ask for asylum in America. So you want there to be more illegal immigration? I guess what I'm saying, just in the interest of succinctness, I'm okay with some people, even a relatively large number of people, showing up on our border and asking for asylum. Because? Well, relative to the huge population. We already have 330 million people. Even a million people a year is only one third of one percent. So you want a million people a year to sneak over the border? No. With a false claim of needing asylum? Well, not all claims are going to be false. Yeah. And no, I think I'm, I'm you, saying. You you know, let me say this: even a million is probably um, not my preferred number, but half a million. One sixth of one percent of the current population. I'd be okay with that. So you want a half a million illegals a year asking for asylum and moving through the process? Rick, you know perfectly well that they don't need asylum. They are. They just want to come here because it's a better place to live. So don't lie to me. All right. So fine. You want half a million illegals a year? Okay. Sure. For the sake, I haven't thought much about it, but yeah, I'm fine with that. All right, why do you want half a million illegals a year to come to our country and, and become citizens? Well, for the first 105th, uh, 130 years of America, there was no such thing as an illegal alien. Oh, yes, there was. Okay. How'd that work? Well, the, I mean, when we did, didn't, when we did, we didn't know, allow people into this country unless we wanted. Yeah, so we, somebody gets on a boat on a ship and comes over here in 1850. Does anybody stop them when they get off the boat? Yeah. Who? The American authorities. Yeah, really? Because Ellis Island didn't open up until what, the 1880s? Rick. When did Ellis if, Island Rick, open up? If the, 
if the population of Mexico decided it wanted to live in America, we had an army to prevent that, and it would have. But that's what we had the war, the Mexican War in the, 18, in the 1840s was about territorial disputes between Texas and Mexico. So and there was a point before the Democrats took over when this country respected its own border. As far as immigration from the rest of the world goes, we've always had quotas. No, we and haven't. We haven't out. always had quotas. Well, yes. Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, we haven't yeah. always had quotas. Right. You can right. read about the right. you can read about the history of quotas. Right. And we always had control over which countries we would accept immigrants from and how many. No, that's just not true. Right. I don't know when right. quotas right. You, kicked you, in. You can say whatever you want, but, but this the, is United what States, you want to... the United States had an elaborate system. Well, let's, then, let's stop now. Because we're... No, 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 wait a minute. And, and furthermore, the, the, for, they would check for several things. Not only... Well, TB, be, cholera, communicable yeah, they diseases. they would check for diseases, and not only that, but they would send people back. They'd, yeah. say, they'd say, you had a trip over here on a boat, now you're going right back. Okay, but let's let's stop down, because we need to break anyway. Wait a minute, wait. You're going to argue with me that the United States never controlled immigration to its borders? No, I'm saying that the United States didn't exert much control until the second half of the 19th century, after we'd already been a country for, you know, 80 years. We've only been a country with a president for 230 years. For the first third of that time, no, we didn't effectively exercise control over who came here. The United, so, the United States did not control its borders before the 1850s, is what you're telling me. I'm saying we didn't have immigration quotas, and I'm saying that any How kind of, do you know this, just out of curiosity? Well, for instance, I know about the, the Immigration Control Act of I think 1922. But but you're but, saying which, you're saying that Jefferson and Monroe and and uh, the uh, and and Andrew Jackson, uh, those people did not control who came to the United States. I, let's stop down and read about it for well, half a well, second. Why is it? Why is this? Does this kind of thing have to be a mystery to you? Well, the America, so, so if, if a million people from Russia wanted to come to the colonies, George Washington would have done nothing. Yeah, but a million people didn't try. Well, then you're arguing about something that's irrelevant. But let's look at the history and see what did happen. Let's just take a break, because I want to take a break anyway, and just um, we'll Google it. Wrong. 110.3. Okay, this is from the official website of the Department of Homeland Security, U.S. Citizenship, and Immigration Services. Early American Immigration Policies. Americans encouraged relatively free and open immigration during the 18th and early 19th centuries, centuries rarely questioning that policy until the late 1800s, after certain states passed immigration laws following the Civil War the Supreme Court in 1875 declared regulation of immigration a federal responsibility. Thus, as the number of immigrants rose in the 1880s and economic conditions in some areas worsened, Congress began to pass immigration legislation. That's it. Right, well, my only argument is that We weren't facing uh, an immigration crisis in the 1820s. Uh, if, if we were getting a million people coming over the border a year, as we do now, uh, I think something would have been done. I also think that, uh, although uh, Rick has certainly proven his point, I don't think it's relevant. Because as soon as it became a big issue after the Civil War in the 1860s, <laughs> the United States started to uh, regulate its immigration. All right. So, Great. so you can't, you can't, you can't say that because for 40 years or so we we had we didn't have any much regulation, 
of immigration. Uh, th therefore, we need to let a million people pour over the southern border every year. Well, all right, to put numbers in it, um, during, the, during the Revolutionary War in the 1770s and 80s, the U.S. had three million people. So a million people pouring into America would have been one-third of the already year population. We didn't see that. And it's not 40 years, it's, it's from 1790 when we became a you know, full-on nation with a president and everything, until 1880. So it's, it's closer to, to 90 years. Where, no, it was... It was or uh, 18... I, we defeated the British, I think, in 1783. Yeah, but then, then we didn't... And then, we, we, and then we're talking about the Civil War, which is... 18, which ended in 1865. Yeah, but then the legislation doesn't, the Supreme Court doesn't rule until 1870. Right, but some states started at right. in, the, in the in the 1860s. But but the point is is that it wasn't a big enough issue, and you can't say that there is a great American tradition of letting unfettered hordes of people pour into the country when it it just didn't. It wasn't a big deal in 1790. Yeah, but I mean, the math is tricky because, as I said, for every person alive during, of every American alive during the Revolutionary War, there are 110 Americans now. So, you know, maybe a million people asking for asylum is too much, and we should work harder to discourage well, you that. You said half a million was your number. Well, I just said maybe a million is too much. And maybe so you we want half do... a million. You, you just told me five, 15 minutes ago that you wanted half a million. So I said maybe a million is minutes. too much. And so half a million is, is less than that, right? That's how it works. Right. So, and I would say that maybe we can look at solutions that don't include ridiculous levels of cruelty. For instance, you know, Trump threatens to cut off a, to, a, to a trio of of Central American countries, if they don't do something about the people leaving the Central American countries because conditions are shit there. So we're going to make the Central American countries worse by cutting off aid um, to, in the hopes that people don't leave those countries. Well, the, the reason that those countries are getting that aid is they are corrupt oligarchies and probably half of that aid goes to the government. Uh, so those countries are just getting worse. The aid is probably, uh, in Africa, a lot of uh, forward-thinking Africans have actually said, stop giving us aid, because the only thing that happens is our, di our, is our dictator and his family takes the money. All right, well, those well, countries, one third of the population of El Salvador lives in the United America. States. Right, so. So, so things are not improving. Weirdly, um, it's, it, it's a good time to point out that Trump's threats against Mexico have paid off because the Mexicans have now put 15,000 troops on their northern border. Southern. Nope, 6,000 on the south, 15 on the north. Oh. They've also, uh, they have also, are now considering uh, keeping Mexicans uh, keeping people seeking asylum in their country instead of letting them come into our country uh, and then ask for asylum, where well, where they'll be put wherever the hell we can find a place to put them. And finally, the Wait, people, can I say something? and finally the people of Mexico have decided on a jobs program. They're going to keep uh, thousands of laborers that would have poured over the U.S. border in northern Mexico, and they're going to try and give them jobs there. All, right. All because of Trump, the man you hate. All right, so I would naively say that seems to be a good thing. Um, though I'm still not going to vote for freaking Trump. By the way, how do you feel about the polls? You, are you stoked? Uh, Rick, that the polls have Trump losing almost by 15, 20% at this moment. And Lance, how do you feel it's, about it's that? Are you still, worried? It's still more than 490 days until the election. That's 70 weeks. 
That's more than one and a quarter years. So much shit can happen um, that, you know, it, it's way too early. And, I mean, it, it's a sad characteristic of the voracious and, and often shallow um, appetites of the 24-hour news channels that we have to fucking hash over these kind of polls, you know, 15 months before the fucking election. And on the good news for Lance is Trump is at 54% 50 approval rate today. No, he's <laughs> fucking not. If you're going off of Rasmussen, that's just, that's a horse shit. That's the, they call landlines. You know who has landlines? I have a landline. I'm old as fuck. If you call landlines, you're going to get old people. Old people tend to lean more towards Trump. All the other polls don't have him at 55. I don't know, 50, well, you got that off a of drudge. And he says that you should really add 10% to that because yeah, of all well, the... Fucking so he's Come technically on. at 70%. All right, all right, let's get to the, what we're calling science corner this week. What, but Lance, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I do. Uh, I, the Democrats were caught... Uh, okay, I am worried about losing the election because this week, uh, the Democrats were, were caught at Google trying to control searches so that if you search for good information about Republicans, Google would route your search to bad information about Republicans. Uh, it would also control the information so that Democrats would look better. And this was revealed by a whistleblower at Google and internal documents that show that Google is trying to uh, influence the election so that the Trump will be defeated. The second thing is that I believe the Democrats are using illegals to vote. Uh, it's a long argument. Rick doesn't have to believe it, but I think they'll cheat. I think that the combination of cheating using Google and their control over the media to lie will, call, will make them a dangerous opponent under any circumstances. Okay. And just to wrap that up, um, just got to say, just research the whole frickin' voting thing. And you'll probably find offenses on both sides of various types. However, as a liberal, and I think a, a decent researcher, um, I would claim that the, the, the offenses in fucking with the vote and the election, um, that more of it's done by the Republicans. But let's move on to it. And just one last one. And are, are we gonna and you on? can just say yay or nay. Um, are you excited about Mueller testifying before Congress on July 17th? Uh, Some. Okay, I why? Mean, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. A little excited, though, you know, his his stuff has been muted by clever opposition and maybe by some of his own reluctance to uh, draw conclusions. Um, so it could be another, you know, uh, you know, deflated balloon. I'm more worried about what looks like Nancy Pelosi's passivity where she seems to have done the calculation, and maybe Schumer, that um, given the situation with the polls, that it's maybe safer not to go hard after Trump, that, that the Democrats will win, the 20, will win 2020 as long as we don't you know, kick the, uh, the uh, beehive that is impeachment. But who knows? But all right, let's talk about... Wait, wait, Lance? Well, one of the things that Nancy Pelosi said, and I said this a few weeks ago, but Rick dis disagreed with me, so I guess Nancy Pelosi and I are in agreement against Rick, is that you can't negate the votes of 62 million Trump supporters on a technicality. This is actually, this is actually what Nancy Pelosi said. She said that you have to have something really big and clear if you're going to remove a man from office. And she said, we just don't, we as Democrats just don't have that. Yeah, well, nobody's removing 
Trump from office unless it's maybe his eating habits. Um, what would you ask Mueller, Lance? Well, what I would ask him is, one, I'd like to know when he knew that Trump didn't collude with Russia. Because he kept this thing going until after the 2018 elections in order to cast uh, uh, a, a suspicion and, and, and dirty the Trump administration, knowing full well that there was no uh, collusion with Russia. And so I'd ask him that. I'd ask him why every single person that he hired to investigate Trump was a Democrat or had contributed money to the Clinton campaign. And there, there were no Trump supporters or conservatives on his team of 17 lawyers. Because that shows, uh, that has the appearance of impropriety. That's, I mean, that's a good question. And I think the Republicans. I, I, I'm not finished. Yeah, but all right, I'm just going to say, I think that question will be asked. I think both of those questions will be asked. Though I would disagree with you about there being, but I don't know, no, fuck it. I want to get done, so let's, I won't disagree with you. Okay, go ahead. Now let's change subjects, and I'm going to get ready for that. Okay, okay so um, our director tells me that we're in here in LA. Our director tells oh, me can you that, um, Thank you. that in other parts of the country, people aren't familiar with um, choosing your own pronoun. And I, I don't, I tend not to believe that, but maybe so. And the deal is that. Um, people, particularly younger people, um, are choosing the pronouns they would prefer to be used in reference to themselves by other people um, based on uh, their um, believed gender identification rather than their biological gender identification if those two things disagree. So that a person who was born biologically male but identifies as female may ask people to identify her as, she, or refer to her as she and her. Somebody who um, identifies as gender fluid um, may ask people to um, uh, refer to them as them and they. When I had a, a few years ago, this was a little weird for me because them and they, I was taught, you know, for 30 years, is a plural pronoun referring to more than one person. And it was grammatically weird um, to refer to a single person as them or they. I'm over that. Um, and I would say as a general principle, in these times, it's an interesting and perhaps helpful exercise um, to see if you can talk about someone without referencing their gender or racial characteristics. For instance, it just is our director told me a story about somebody who got in big trouble. Um, a girl who referred to some people, I have to identify her by race because it's essential to the story, but the girl um, referred to, a white girl referred to a couple other people as Negroes. And she uh, got fired. Uh, um, apparently, uh, the story's not entirely clear, but it might be because she was reported for not calling people Negroes, but for calling them the N word. But I gotta say that just it's white people shouldn't refer to to anybody as Negroes. And really, as a general principle, um, well, here I'll tell a personal story. It's 1984, and my girlfriend, um, at the time, an increasingly angry feminist, and I are just leaving. 
I want to say Applebee's in Boulder, Colorado. I've got a to-go container containing a sandwich and french fries. Um, I see a pair of women who, and I, one of them has a swirly shaved haircut. You know those mints, those red and white swirly mints you get at some old school restaurants? Her haircut looked like that, a buzz cut. It was entirely bald, some of it, but like a pinwheel with baldness and buzz cut. And I wanted to point out um, the haircut because I thought it was pretty cool. And I go, look at those uh, two gay women over there. And my girlfriend, my angry girlfriend, says, how do you know they're gay? And then I start listing the reason. Well, they're holding hands. They've got buzz cuts. They're wearing military boots. And one of them has, like, eight gay pride buttons on her jean jacket. And my girlfriend um, argues that's still not enough proof. We have this, this argument continues as we walk out into the middle of Arapahoe Boulevard, at which point my girlfriend takes the to-go container and throws it at my head. It bounces off of my head, and it was just a great moment because the, the thing popped open and formed a corona, a halo of French fries, three feet in di six feet in diameter, around my head in the middle of traffic. And um, I just, it was humiliating, but I also thought it was just vi a, a visually exciting way to be humiliated by food. But it also taught me to just uh, see if you can talk about people without identifying them as gay or a particular race or, or whatever. It's just, um, you know, it's just, it keeps you out of trouble in these sensitive times. The end. Anything else, Lance? Uh, I hope to God that the rest of society learns that your uh, masochism is uh, going to make things worse for everybody. Um, I don't, I refuse to refer to people as them or they. If I know that they were born male, I'm going to refer to them as men. Um, I think it's very, uh, I think people that hack off their genitals are mentally ill, and I'm not doing them any favor uh, to refer to them by their delusion. Um, and, and I think what we've learned is that Rick has uh, accepted a state of uh, degeneracy in our society in a, a, a bid to, I don't know, be liked better or something. A bid to my angry girlfriend. Yes. We had, I'm sorry, we had so much really good angry sex. It was so, in the interest of, of the, the best angry sex of my life, um, I, I, it was a, not referring to people as gay um, was a, a small sacrifice to make. I, I'd like the people of the audience to know how much men lie to the women that they're with just to get to bed and and you know, I, I call it now something better. I just say, I don't fight about the little things. You know what I mean? And that way I, I sort of tell myself that this is just the way it has to be. But I, I understand your point, Rick. Okay, so, so how do you refer to yourself as Lance? He, she, they, just for the record? Well, I just want to reiterate that uh, people with gender confusion are 40 times more likely to kill themselves. And the statistic hardly changes at all after they've had the operation to change sexes. I'd like to say so, about that. So what that proved to the researchers at Johns Hopkins, the pioneers of the surgery, was that people that come in with gender dysphoria don't need their genitals to be hacked off they need psychiatry. Just uh, the last part, 
they need their genitals what, Lance? Okay, what the researchers at Johns Hopkins discovered was that people that wanted their gender to be changed, their genitals to be hacked off, were actually mentally ill, and they needed to be treated for depression because they were because giving them the operation did not particularly reduce the chances of their suicide. So when what what Rick is doing is unthinkingly contributing to this sort of uh, depression and and ultimately getting a lot of people killed. I would disagree with the results of this study, and I would also yeah, say... Yeah, you, you would disagree with John Hopkins University. Well, I would, I would say this, I would say system. this, that the vast majority of people who are trans uh -huh. don't, don't chop up, don't mess with their genitals. Oh, um, God, not this again. Yeah, but all right, we don't have to, because we want to wrap it up. Can they get pregnant, though? Because I think Kostra referred to that trans people can get... Abortions. I don't want to go into that. Oh, so. thank you. I'm sorry. The director did help me. The Democrat, one of the Democrat candidates said that he thought that abortion should be a right for women and for transgenders. All right, so, so that's the party you're voting for, right? Well, uh, you know, all right. So there was a guy a few years ago who was born a, a born female, um, but got pregnant twice and had two kids. Twice. He, twice he got pregnant. He had a beard, um, but he still had enough female stuff going on that he could be he could carry a child. Um, so it, the whole thing is a little bizarre, but it's not that bizarre. Um, anyway, nothing is too bizarre for the Democrats to make an issue about it in a national debate. All right. So, the, but all right. Nothing. Nothing is too weird. Nothing is too strange for the Democrats not to insist on it. Don't make me bring up um, taking Ivanka. Anyway, fucking, let's wrap it up. So are you a he, she, they, we, uh, what? What? How do you identify, Lance? I, I, I mean, identify I, as he and him, Okay. but I rock women's wear because I've got a nice waist, I've got a, 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 a small but firm butt. As long as I can wear thigh-high boots um, to cover up my varicose veins, um, I'd be okay with in a future where, um, you know, I could wear a, a, a swingy skirt. Just for the record, the director identifies as they. Just tell the people. All right, our director identifies as they. Uh, right. Thank night. you. Good night. Good night. Good night. All right, let's do the genius thing real quick. Oh no! It'll take five minutes. <laughs>